good singing tonight. We're turning back to the book of Colossians. And we are in the practical section of chapters 3 and 4. Where there is an extended exhortation in regards to how we are to live as Christ people. I would like to turn your attention back to chapter number one for just a moment so that the groundwork might be laid. It's a couple of weeks since we've been in Colossians. One thing we want to make sure we do is keep the first two chapters connected with chapters three and four. And a central focus of the book of Colossians is the Lord Jesus Christ. Another emphasis is that of the gospel. So if you'll listen to uh, where Paul started in writing to this church, and then we'll turn over to chapter 3, and we will see uh, the application of what it means for God to have done for us what he did for us in Christ. He writes in chapter 1 and verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, Whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. As ye have also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us of your love in the spirit. For this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Notice verse 10, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. And hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him. And for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Now turn over to chapter number three and follow. After Paul has corrected the false teaching that is creeping into the church, he turns and begins to talk about that worthy walk. He begins to talk about what it means to be in Christ and when we're living in Christ, what our lives will look like. And he starts with four imperatives. If ye then be risen with Christ, or since you are risen with Christ, the first imperative is seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Secondly, Set your affection on things above. Contrast, not on things on the earth. Reason, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. The third directive that he gives is in verse 5. 
Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. All the self sins, all the things that would have been part of their lives before Christ, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence or lust, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which you also walked sometime when you lived in them. And imperative number four in verse number eight. But now ye also put off all these. And these again are characteristics of our lives before Christ. Anger and wrath and malice and blasphemy and filthy communication out of your mouth. You know, that first list is a testimony of how we use other people for ourselves. The second list seems to be how we treat other people as we advance ourselves. This blasphemy in this case would be uh, against people, this malice, this anger, this wrath, this filthy uh, communication. So what we've done is we've given an overview of this chapter and part of chapter four entitled The Normal Christian Life. And what we're trying to do is to uh, stop and recognize that normal for us is not based upon our experience. It's not based upon what we know. It's not based upon our subjective deductions or conclusions. Normal is what God has declared. See, normal Christianity would have to be what God does through the spirit of Christ for those who are trusting in Christ. So normal Christianity can never be measured or defined by our experience, even a corporate experience or definition. It has to be defined by how God defines it. It can't be defined by our day, our culture, what Christianity is in our day has nothing to do with God's definition of normal Christianity. And I say that to you because normalcy for us, we will drift there. We will go there. We will default there. If we don't have a clear understanding of what God says is to be our lives, what God says Christ will do in our lives, we will default to a definition of Christianity that simply reflects the Christianity of our day. And as we know, that has waxed worse and worse throughout the decades. And so we're turning to God's word to look at the idea of normal Christianity as revealed by the Lord that we serve and as produced by the Holy Spirit. See, that first par paragraph you listened to in chapter one talked about what God would do. This is not something we do. This is not something we stick on the outside. This is not something we put up when we're around other Christians. This is who Christ makes us. If we are truly Christian and if we're truly yielding to the spirit of Christ. And so he's going to get right down to where we live. And he begins in regards to the Christian and Christ. So three weeks ago, that's where we went. We looked at the first eight verses of Colossians chapter three, normal, the normal Christian life, the Christian and Christ. What did that involve? Let me remind you. It involved giving Christ his rightful place practically. Where is he, by the way? Chapter one, seated at the right hand of the father. Who is he? He's the creator. What place does he occupy? He's the preeminent one. Does that mean that he was the preeminent one in my life today? Not necessarily. When Paul turns in chapter three and says, if you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. He is saying to you and to me, give Christ the preeminence that the father has given him. And that doesn't happen automatically. It's a directive for us. Give him his rightful place. What is his rightful place? It's not a, it's not a trick question. It's the highest place. It's the highest place. It's the priority place. And, and you can think that out. You're here on a Wednesday night. You've moved through three days this week. Has Jesus Christ occupied the highest possible place in your life? 
the first three days of this week. It's very practical and very helpful. And, and, and as we put that up there, we say, okay, but this is what God defines as normal Christianity. Did I live normal Christianity the first three days of this week? Or have other things crowded him out? Have I actually gotten into a pattern where other things do occupy? The reason the Lord tells us to do these things, folks, is because they're not automatic. They do take something from us. We can't just drift through life and Jesus Christ have the preeminent place, the priority place. So the first directive is that we give him his rightful place practically. And folks, that's the place he already occupies with the father. The second one is aligning our thinking with his, setting your affection. That word really is a word that has to do with our mindset. Set your mind, set your mind on things above. So the second was to align our thinking with his thinking. Uh, fix your thoughts elsewhere. Now, I hope you were encouraged when we looked at that. I know that I've thought about it much since then. I'm to set my affection, I'm to set my mind on above things. Above things. That's difficult to do, isn't it? Because the below things are the things that we get up to every day. The below things are the things that discourage us every day. The below things include things I look back on and I look around at and I look forward to. Those are the below things. But God has given Jesus Christ the preeminent priority, high place in heaven. And he turns and he says, now, Mike, set your mind there. So what happens when I see the below things? I set my mind on the above things and then I can handle the what? The below things. So what is God doing? What is God choosing for me? Even things that I would not choose for myself. How is it? Where is it that I find myself? The answer is the same for all of us. God's answer to that is set your mind on above things. And that way you will be able to, in a God honoring way, deal with the below things. I find that extremely helpful. I find a need to do that every day. People talk about having devotions, read four chapters, check it off. No, it's meeting with God and saying, no, Lord, I need help with this. Uh, Paul prayed that we would be strengthened, that we would know him and that we would know him in a greater way and that we would walk worthy. And Lord, I cannot do this without your help. But my desire is to align my thinking with your thoughts. Give him the rightful place, the highest place, align my thinking with his thoughts. And then verses five through seven, we saw that we're to drain the life out of everything that dishonors the Lord. All of those characteristics in five through seven are just uh, things of our old life. The self life occupies itself with inordinate affection and fornication, uncleanness, all those things. And then the fourth is to stop making allowances for sinful expressions. I don't think it's a misunderstanding to look at verse number eight and recognize that all of those things have to do with how what's inside of me comes out of me. Anger and wrath and malice and blasphemy and filthy communication. He says, put off all these things. Do not allow these things. Stop making allowances for sinful expression. See, these insults, this whittling people down to lift ourselves up, this hurting people with words because we're frustrated, that's not allowed for Christians. Corrupt communication that destroys other people, God says that's out of line. Christ does not do that. And so I see all of these in verse number eight as sinful expressions, this burning anger that breaks out in hurtful spewing words, insults, derogatory expressions against other people. That's all an overspill of a heart that's not ruled by Christ. Now, let me give you hope. There's one answer to that. Lord, will you forgive me? And then whoever I have spoken angry words to, will you forgive me? 
And then what? Let's start over again. Let's start fresh again. He who covers his sin. Do you believe God's word tonight? He who covers his sin. What's the rest of it? Will not prosper. It's a, a fool who believes that he can keep sinning against almighty God and do nothing about it and prosper. Not going to happen. So the way of Christ, the Christian and Christ in the first eight verses tonight, the Christian and the local church. Now, these are not hard and fast divisions. These are the way the, the, we're dividing this to go through it. But I, I think you will see when it turns in verse number nine to the one another's. I really believe that has to do with our relationship with one another here, because later it's going to turn to the home in uh, verse number 18. So the normal Christian life, the Christian and the local church. Now, what you see there on your outline is that normal Christianity is lived out in the context of local church life. I'm not sure I would have had to say that 40 years ago. I'm not sure I would have had to say that 40 years ago. Zoom church is not church, folks. Home church is not church. You can't find that in the Bible. Church is God's people living out as the body of Christ, the things that God has put in the scripture. So we've got a whole lot of people who have left church and never came back to church everywhere. People who got frustrated with church, people that are going to, you know, them and their family, they're going to figure all this out. You're not going to do that biblically. You're not going to do that biblically. You say, well, about the house churches in China, a house church in China is not people staying home to have their own church. They're not recognized by the government. It's, it's 25 or 30 people slipping off in secret to meet together because the Bible does not give any idea that we can do these things without doing this without being together. And so I just wanted to lay that in front of us that this independent Christianity is a contradiction to the scriptures. Maverick Christianity is a contradiction to the scriptures. It cannot be supported from the scriptures. The head, Jesus Christ, works in and through local congregations like this. The Acts model, folks, is the only authentic model that we have. And the epistles instruction is very clearly for a congregational context where we function together and we live out these things. I don't have any problem loving one another if nobody else is around. I can do love one another in my living room. But you start throwing me in the context of other believers. Now... I understand why well, I need to be told to love one another because we're not all the same. We're not all the same by design, not all the same by personality. We're not all the same by giftedness, Corinthians. But we are to love one another. You can't love one another if you're not with one another. So here we are tonight and we're transitioning to this emphasis in verse number nine and following. So first of all, come together. You see a first blank there. Come together around the Christ who unites us. Who unites us. See, I, I read to you those verses in the first chapter for this reason. The thing that brings us together is Christ. It's not a common hobbies. <laughs> It's not common likes. It's Christ come together around the Christ who unites us. He is the head. The church is a new creation. You have an arrow there. The church is a new creation. It's a renewed, a renewed society. The church is a new creation, a renewed society. Each of us and all of us. We share this one another life together. Verse number nine says, lie not one to another. Uh, verse number 13 tells us we are to be forbearing one another and forgiving one another. And then verse number 16 talks about us teaching and admonishing 
one another. So in this short paragraph, we have four references to this one another ministry that we enjoy as a local fellowship of believers. In verse number nine, he says, lie not one to another. Lie not one to another. Stop lying to one another. That can be translated. The idea is before Christ, people were dishonest with one another. And he says here, stop, never lie one to another. You're no longer the people you were before. See it in verse nine, lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, namely the deed of being untruthful, of being dishonest. Paul is saying there's no room for deception. How else do we lie to one another? How about pretense? about pretending to be something we're not (laughs) that's a way that we lie to one another how about half truth do we lie when we tell half truths yeah so the idea is no deception no pretense no half truths no false impressions rather we're to be truth people we're to be people of truth we're to be truth speakers this is to be a genuine fellowship with the head The Lord Jesus Christ and other body members who are truth people living under the rule of Christ. So that doesn't allow for any of those old life deceptions. It doesn't allow for any old man lying because everything's new. Everything's after his image. Look at verse 10. You have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So the church is a new creation, a renewed society, restored, first of all, to a fresh way of living, a fresh way of living. You know, we have to be willing to hear the truth from each other. A renewed people, people recreated in his image, verse number 10 says, this speaks of authenticity, of genuineness, of transparency. Of integrity it even speaks of harmony, doesn't it? Speaking the truth, restored to a fresh way of living. Secondly, discarding all of the old divisions. Discarding all of the old divisions is the second we have here. We find that in verse number 11. Now, these things uh, don't resonate exactly with us, but most of us already have a sense of what's going on here. Look at it in verse number 11. Where there's neither Greek nor Jew. So we have nationality differences in that day. The the Greeks called the Jews dogs. The Jews called the Greeks dogs. And there was a a great animosity between these two groups of people. Then there's circumcision and uncircumcision. Uh, More divisions. The ceremonies, right? The rituals of the Jews versus the non-Jews. And then barbarian. We know what a barbarian is, don't we? It comes from a word that they came up with when they couldn't understand somebody. Barbar. (laughs) Barbar. That's what they sound like. You know, you you listen to somebody that you don't understand their language back in the day. Barbar. So it came up with barbarian. That's somebody um, that is, uh, uh, has a language barrier. But then there's another word here that I had to do some study on. What's a Scythian? (laughs) You know, a Scythian is a savage. Yeah. Scythian is somebody that's way out there. Describes somebody that lives like a wild beast. Now listen to what the Bible's saying. Talking about the church. Talking about people saved out of that. There is none of that in the church. There's none of that division in the church. Bond nor free, we understand that one, don't we? Those that were slaves were chattel. They, they were owned. They had no rights of their own. Those that were slave owners needed to understand that in Christ, they were completely on the same level with those that are bond. So what is Paul saying about the church? He's saying that all the geographical and societal and cultural and language dividers are set aside in Christ. 
All of those things that would naturally divide us no longer divide us. There's no, no enmity. There's no looking down on other believers. There's no assuming a high place over other believers. Rather, it's one new man. It's one new society. It's one common Lord. There's no status. There's no unbridgeable gaps within the body. So Paul is speaking to what normal Christianity looks like in the church when God is having his way. We've been restored to a fresh way of living. You know, we're truth people. We've discarded all of the old divisions. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter what your history is. What matters is that you're in Christ. That's been the focus of the book since it started. Folks, we have to work at this, don't we? We naturally elevate ourselves sometimes. And Paul's saying, no room for that. There is no room for that. And in the second part of verse number 11, the last few words, he says, but Christ is all in all. So restored to a fresh way of living, discarding all of the old divisions and embracing the, just put it there, the all in all of Christ. The all in all of Christ. What is Paul saying? He's saying Christ is all that matters. Christ is all that matters. Do you understand what it means to preach to yourself? When you're in a situation where you recognize that old man stuff's coming up again. And you preach to your own soul quietly, hopefully. All that matters is that they're in Christ. Our mouth drops open when we hear something that some Christian did. All that matters is that they're in Christ. And God has provided for their reconciliation. God has provided for the fact that he knew they were dust and they were going to fail. That has a calming impact on an agitated soul. Christ is all in all. Christ is all that matters and Christ is sufficient for all that matters, right? Christ is all that matters and the book has taught us that Christ is sufficient for all that matters. Our standing is in Christ. Our daily needs are met in Christ. Our sins are cleansed away in Christ. Christ is everything to everyone that is a Christian. Boy, what a set of glasses that is, right? Just put that on. Christ is everything to everyone that is in Christ. Wow, well, the ground to be very level, doesn't it? Restored to a fresh way of living, honesty, truth speaking, genuine, integrity, discarding all the divisions, cultural divisions, racial divisions, language divisions, um, even religious divisions in that day between the Jews and others. Embracing the all in all of Christ. And then lastly, God's chosen ones. It's right out of the text here. Holy and beloved. Verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect, which means chosen of God, holy and beloved. God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, a new people, a holy nation. Those three terms are used of Israel. Well, now they're used of the New Testament church. Chosen in Christ, saints of Christ, specially loved by God, recipients of grace, responders to God's grace, a transformed, regenerated people that have been placed in a new family, a new society, distinct, a new kingdom reflecting the king, come together around the Christ who unites us. The hope, first of all, is that all walls of separation are eliminated. All walls of separation or division have been eliminated. The original image bearing has been restored. We've been granted spiritual life where we were spiritually dead before. So all the walls of separation or division have been eliminated. The possibility for us as God's people, as the church, is that Christ will be all that matters. The possibility where Christ is all that matters. Christ is 
all that matters. Would you tell yourself that? Would you remind yourself of that? Would you use that understanding when you find yourself in a, a dilemma where it seems like you cannot turn your heart away from some hurt that you've received or some unfair conclusion that someone has made? Just take the truth of God's word and recognize that when he's saying that Christ is all in all, he is telling us that Christ is really all that matters. And when that's the case, all of the other things that get in the way and cause such challenges for us will be seen in their right perspective. The normal Christian life, the local church, the Christian in the local church, normal Christianity is lived out in the context of local church life. A twofold emphasis or admonition. The first one, come together around the Christ who unites us. Secondly, address all elements that divide and destroy. Now, this is certainly where Paul has been heading with the things that he has said thus far in the book. Address all elements that divide and destroy. Satan's having a ball, isn't he? He's having a ball, dividing God's people. The Christians are new people. You see there behind the arrow, Christians are new people living out Christ. They're living out Christ. They're putting on and putting off. They're the elect of God. They're holy and beloved. So from verse number nine, we might say it this way. Be true to who you are in Christ. Be true to who you are in Christ. Now, the emphasis there was the emphasis on honesty and speaking the truth and being people of integrity. Be true to who you are in Christ. Secondly, be ruled by the spirit of Christ. Be ruled by the spirit of Christ. Let's take up these terms in verse number 12. Be ruled by the spirit of Christ within. Now, these are familiar to us because we find them other places in the New Testament. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. What does he want us to put on? The first one is bowels of mercies. Bowels of mercies. That's a, word, a phrase that describes compassion. It describes a heart of pity. Once again, we don't naturally have this toward other people. A sensitivity, a tenderness, a compassion. These are relational terms. Bowels of mercies. Be ruled by the spirit of Christ within. Put this on. Bowels of mercies, compassion, tenderness, a heart of pity and sensitivity toward other people. Folks, that's the character of God lived out. Now, I'm just going to say this to you and you can take it and think about it. But you and I know that sometimes we walk with people for years who show absolutely no interest in us. Christian people who have absolutely no interest in other Christian people. That's a problem. No pity, no compassion, no interest in anything but themselves, their own struggles, their own ideas, and their own advancement. Folks, that is not Christ. And you're thankful for that. That is not Christ. Pity, compassion, tenderness, sensitivity. That's the character of God. It's the character of God. Secondly, kindness. What does that mean? <laughs> kindness. Kindness. Love is what? It's kind. Love is kind. It's a sweet disposition, isn't it? Kindness is a sweet disposition. It's serving others as Christ serves. It's a word that described wine that had been mellowed. Wine that had been mellowed was smooth instead of harsh. That's, what, that's how the word is used. When Jesus says, my yoke is, there's our word, easy. 
So if Christ is having his way in my life, guess what is going on in my soul and what will come out of me? There's going to be, first of all, compassion, bowels of mercy. There's going to be kindness. There's going to be an, an easiness. And the people that I live with and the people that I walk with are going to be able to see that there is an easiness. There's a, a sweet disposition. And folks, this is not something that boom happens when we get saved. It's something that God mellows <laughs> in our lives as we walk with him and we walk with each other. And when we don't see these things, we've got to stop and say, hold on a minute. That's not normal. <laughs> it's not normal for me to walk in here and walk out of here and not really care anything about anybody else but myself. That is not normal Christianity. That is not what Christ does in our lives. Church is not something where we show up and everybody claps their hands because we showed up. It's where the body functions. And when I have the heart of Christ, and I don't always have the heart of Christ, but when I do, it is a tender, sensitive compassion. It is a sweet disposition. It's a genuine concern. How about humbleness of mind? Well, that has a twofold impact. It has a twofold emphasis. The first emphasis of that is that I am a creature who am, who's walking before my creator. And that in itself should keep me lowly, shouldn't it? But it also has something to do with our relationship with each other. I'm one creature walking among other creatures. This idea here is a right evaluation of ourselves. And I love thinking about it that way because I can stop and talk to the Lord about that. Humbleness, is of, humbleness of mind is a right evaluation of ourselves. Who are we? We're creatures under our creator and we're creatures walking with other creatures. Where's the room for pride in that? Where's the room for disregard in that? Where's the room for all of those negative characteristics of 1 Corinthians 13 and that humbleness of mind is lowliness. It's the idea of bending low versus asserting ourselves. What about meekness? Meekness. Well, essentially to be meek is to not be harsh. <laughs> to not be harsh. When we're tested and God chooses test for us. Moses was the meekest man that lived. And when you look at his life, other than Christ, he, you look at his life and you say, what, how do we know about the meekness of Moses? I think because of the extreme testing that Moses went through. And Moses, as a pattern, wasn't reactionary. In fact, when he was reactionary, that got him kept, kept out of the promised land, didn't it? But he'd throw himself between God and the people. He'd plead the case of the people before God. He was willing to go up and meet with God and come back down and talk to the people because through all of those tests, and we know as we read through the Old Testament scriptures, the tests that he went through, he was not harsh as a pattern. And, and you could see that God's spirit was ruling his spirit. Meekness is really God's spirit ruling my spirit. You, you know, the, the, the phrase in the flesh, do you ever get in the flesh? Okay, a couple of us. <laughs> You, you ever get in the flesh and cover it up? Yeah, we get really good at that, can't we? We can be in the flesh and walk away and make sure nobody knows we're in the flesh, but we are in the flesh. What does that mean? It means Christ's spirit is not governing our spirit. It might be a very right thing to do to walk away, by the way, and ask the spirit of Christ to what? Rule my spirit. Rule my spirit. Help me. Find the closet and ask the Holy Spirit to rule your spirit. The ruling of God's spirit within produces meekness. And the last one is long suffering, which is a word that means long tempered. We know what short tempered is, don't we? <laughs> well, this is the very opposite of that. It's long tempered. It's patient. What happens when we're provoked? What happens when we're provoked? Well, it comes out whether we're long tempered or Short-tempered. And by the way, who is it a reflection on if the words out of my mouth 
call people down to size. Is that a reflection on the people I just called down to size or is that a reflection on the heart of my... It's a reflection on me. And if I'm short-fused and I'm not long-suffering, which, by the way, is part of the fruit of the Spirit, when I'm easily provoked, that's not a reflection on the people around me. I can't grab the church and choke the church because I'm easily provoked. I've got to go to the Lord and say, Lord, I've got a problem. And I need for you to conquer my spirit because Christ, normal Christianity is not what I'm living. And Lord, when you're not happy, I'm not happy. <laughs> when you're not satisfied, I'm not satisfied. Be ruled by the spirit of Christ within and mark it down. When God calls us to this, he has provided for this. He knows you can't do that. He knows I can't do that. He has made provision Verse number 13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel, okay, a conflict here. If any man have a quarrel against you, how should we be forbearing? How should we forgive as Christ forgave you? So also do ye. Verse number 13, enduring when burdens are heaped up, right? <laughs> Forgiving when thoughtlessly sinned against. This is an internal disposition that settles our soul when people fail us, and they will. They will. Should we complain? Should we react? Should we speak harshly? Should we distance ourselves? Should we become cold and indifferent? Or should we follow the example of the Lord Jesus Christ? And then verse number 14, above all things, puts this out put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Really, the picture's love binding everything. Love's binding power. The love that holds the body of Christ together. Have this love as the crowning virtue of all. This fruit of the Spirit. This true perfection of Christ on display. This, this love that holds it together. Which is never based upon the worthiness or value of the one we're loving. It's always a decisional, selfless giving of ourselves despite the unworthiness of those that we love. I can't remember the last time I had a conversation about conflict where the Lord did not impress upon me to say to whoever it was I was talking to, this is more than anything an opportunity for you to demonstrate unconditional love. Because most often we want, to, we want somebody to just go after or go after to fix this. Hold on a minute. If nothing at all ever changes about your present situation, this is your opportunity to demonstrate unconditional love. And don't expect God to change anything until you have learned what he wants you to learn. And that is the fruit of the Spirit. So we can stop praying God will change everybody else. And we can start expecting that God is in the business of changing me. And changing you. The fruit of the Spirit is what? It's love. Everything else in that verse is a description of that love. It's joy and peace. It all is that 1 Corinthians 13 love. So being, be displaying. This is the third there. Be displaying the glories of your Savior. Would you not say that these are the glories of our Savior? Bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing, forgiving. <laughs> How forbearing is the Lord with you? How forbearing is the Lord with me? How many times through the years has the Lord been forbearing with us? And he says, that's the way I want you to be forbearing toward others. How merciful should I be to you? Only as merciful as Christ is to you. Right? Only as merciful as Christ is to me. How forbearing should I be with you? Only as forbearing as Christ is. How forgiving do I have to be with you? Didn't say that very well, did I? Only as forgiving as Christ is toward me. And when you realize how many times in a given day you need to have your sins cleansed. 1 John 1, 7. He keeps, the blood of Christ keeps on cleansing us from sin. Every single day. So what does that mean in regards to one another? That's the picture. And verses 15 to 17, very quickly tonight, I'm going to take some time, some time in verse 16, but 
15, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. That's a beautiful statement. Uh, again, in, in the situations we're in and the one another situations we're in, don't you find yourself just desiring that somehow there was a rheostat installed so you could turn the agitation down? Uh, sometimes we, we in those situations, one of the popular words today is drama, right? Everything with that person's drama. What are you trying to say? You're trying to say, I wish that we could just turn the rheostat down. Does everything have to be over the top? Does everybody have to fuel the fire? Or can somebody say, by God's grace, I'm going to let the peace of God rule my heart. I'm not hopping in this. Now, I've been in a few big fights with lots of people. You know, it was kind of a fo whole football team one night. And it was not fun, but I was smart enough to keep my helmet on and my shoulder pads on. So I fared all right in that fight. But how stupid is that? Well, we do it. If we could just let the, the peace of God rule our hearts. Don't add the fuel. Don't agitate. Say, by God's grace, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to be part of that. Because Christ would not be part of that. See if the Lord will not honor that in our lives. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you're called into one body. And be ye thankful. There's a great reminder. The love is binding us together. The peace is umpiring our heart, which is what the word means. And thanksgiving is what's coming out of our mouths. He expands on that, I believe, in verse number 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So the truth of Christ, which two chapters celebrated, let that truth, let that word dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. Here's what we do for one another. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts of the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Be worshiping. The last of these four lines, be worshiping and serving Jesus Christ wholeheartedly. It, it, there are admonitions here, but would you notice that these admonitions are all laced with references to Christ? How should we forgive and forbear, verse number 13, even as Christ forgave you, right? And, and how about these things that I'm doing, these words and deeds, verse 17, I'm to do them in the name of the Lord Jesus. How about this issue of a wife who's called to submit to her husband in verse 18, as it is fit in the Lord. What about children that are supposed to obey their parents? Verse 20, this is well pleasing unto the Lord. What about servants who are expected to listen and obey their masters? They're not to do it with eye service as men pleasers, verse 22, but they are to do it in singleness of heart. Fearing God. What about verse 23? Whatsoever you do, do it heartily. Next phrase, as unto the Lord. Verse 24, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. Next phrase, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Set your affection on things above. Lock into a view of Jesus Christ in every single thing. And you will and I will be blessed to live out the very life that we were saved to live out. The goal, the goal is maturity and mutual ministry. The goal is maturity and mutual ministry. It really is a genuine compassion and pity and interest in other people. It's a sweet disposition. It's a proper self-assessment. It's, it's not harsh, but it's meek. It's not short-tempered, but long-tempered. The goal is maturity and mutual ministry. And the path, the path, lastly, is individual responsibility and spirit-filling. Spirit-filling. If we had time, we'd turn to... Galatians 5 and look at the, uh, the fruit of the Spirit. We look in Ephesians about be, being filled with the Holy Spirit. But the path to being these kind of people that worship and serve Jesus Christ wholeheartedly 
is taking our own individual responsibility and inviting the Holy Spirit to fill us and guide us. Folks, if you're a Christian tonight, if the Spirit of God is living in you, you can be this kind of person. It will not be because your situation changes. It'll be because you bow before the Lord and allow him to make you who he saved you to be. He's done it throughout history. He can continue to do it. And long we're kicking and screaming and demanding that God changes things before he changes us. We'll keep kicking and screaming because he's got you right where he wants you in order to conform you to the image of Christ. And when you allow that and I will allow that, then we can anticipate all that he has for us throughout this life. We're not there yet. We're not going to be there till we meet Jesus. But I hope you're on the path. I hope you are surrendered to the Lord and inviting him to make you, to shape you, to uh, form you into uh, that which will reflect him. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. That you haven't given up on us. Thank you that you can time after time in this short passage refer to the example of yourself as our reference point. As you've told us to set our affection on things above, to seek first the kingdom of God. Then you show us time and time again that everything you are forming in us is really who you are. It's back to be ye holy for I am holy. It's you desiring your very best for us. Saving us from ourselves, this anger, this wrath, this malice, this corrupt communication is so destructive. The, the ill will toward other people is so wrong. And you're saving us. You want to save us from that. I pray that we would yield to you tonight. And we would seek your forgiveness and the forgiveness of those that we're hurting. And we would be the people that you saved us to be. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.